thousand dollar a night sweets. I had a bag of sherbet lemons, as I recall. <laughs> the park, the grand, and the palace. And it's like summing out a James Bond. I expected, you know, the car chase to come past me any minute, that kind of atmosphere. Mercedes everywhere. And why is it, I wonder, that whenever there's Mercedes around, there's people like that, with shoulders like that, and big double-breasted suits like, and whether they've got bad memories, I don't, I don't know, but they've got little name tags on them, you know was obviously something was going on and <laughs> being organized. So I enjoy the atmosphere for a while. I think it's very strange. And I leave. And then I come back on the last of the four days they met. What a difference. Now I can't get on the mountain leading up to the hotels because the road is blocked by the Swiss police right at the bottom of the mountain. Across the mountain are military lookout posts. According to this journalist, in the early days, there were helicopters all over the mountain um, surveying the place. This is a private meeting of a private organization attended by many, many of the people we see on the news and in the newspapers every week and actually have the opportunity to vote for in this democracy that we're supposed to live in. Incidentally, one of the great myths uh, I feel we need to get over is the fact that democracy is freedom. No, it's not. It's a con trick. Fifty people telling 49 what's going to happen in their lives is not freedom. Or, or in our electoral system in Britain, about 35 telling the rest what's going to happen is certainly not freedom. But freedom and democracy have become interlinked, so one means the other, so we're in a democracy, we are free, so we accept it when we're actually in a tyranny. Anyway, I thought I'd play the ignorant tourist in Bergenstock, you see, which I did with remarkable aplomb. So I come up to the roadblock like, and this Swiss policeman comes over. I knew he was a Swiss policeman because on his back it said Swiss police. You know, my observation is, my, my powers of observation are unbelievable that day. This is a nice man I'm talking to here, spoke very good English. And um, I said to him, look, I said, um, I came here the other day and I, w I went up, the, the, what's the problem today? It was very obvious, he didn't know exactly what was going on, but I remember what he said. He said, it's top secret, top secret, no one up there before five o'clock, after that you'll be able to go back to the hotels. Last day it was. Two things uh, occurred to me. One was the irony that I could have told this guy what was going on up there. Many of the people that were up there, because they're always there, Lord Carrington, Henry Kissinger, David Rockefeller um, of the Rockefeller Empire, which is fundamentally involved in all this. Representatives of the House of Rothschild, also fundamentally involved in this. And many of the other um, key people, uh, like uh, Agnelli, the head of Fiat, and people like that. The big players in the world, banking, political, and uh, business network. The other thing that occurred to me is that I was looking into this policeman's eyes and I was looking at compartmentalization because as I say this was a nice man. He probably had children and grandchildren. He doesn't want to leave them some global tyranny but he doesn't know what he's defending. What has he been told? Top secret meeting, no one passed here till you're told. That's all he knows. So although he doesn't want to leave um, his children, what, not all of the people up there, because some of them are manipulated too, but what the core of that organization wants to leave his children, he doesn't want to. But he doesn't know what he's defending. So on that one afternoon, he's keeping from the public eye some of the people that wish to leave his children exactly that. We had a situation in, uh, in Bergenstock where the secrecy was so uh, fierce for a private organization, a think tank, that they brought them in by private plane to a, <coughs> a military airfield at the bottom of the, uh, the mountain and then flew them behind the security cordon in helicopters. Didn't even drive them up there. And it's amazing how if you, if your attitude turns out to be the right attitude for the people that control that organization, how your career can soar after you're invited to these conflaps. 
In the 1970s, um, certainly outside of Britain, a virtually unknown, very little known, conservative opposition spokesman called Margaret Thatcher started being invited to some Bilderberg meetings. She goes on to be not only leader of the Conservative Party, but leader of Britain, Prime Minister, right through the 1980s when fundamental changes were happening to British society through something called Thatcherism. Interestingly, on the other side of the Atlantic, at the same time, purely by coincidence, of course, we had Reaganomics, which just happened to be the same economic policies. Isn't life funny, all these coincidences? It couldn't just be that the same people made sure both were in power at the same time, because that economics uh, was exactly what was required through the 80s as part of this plan for centralization on a global level. In 1991, uh, even in America, a virtually unknown governor for Arkansas called Bill Clinton was invited to the Bilderberg meeting in Baden-Baden, Germany. Within a year, this guy is successfully running for president of the United States. 1993, another relatively unknown Labour Party Home Affairs spokesman in Britain called Tony Blair was invited to the Bilderberg meeting in Greece, along with his opponent, the Conservative Chancellor, Kenneth Clark, by the way. Within a year, 